Okay, so uh, we're very happy to, to have um, Nathaniel from MIT telling us about the uh, quantum extreme surfaces in isolated black holes. Okay, Neta, your turn, and thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Monica, and thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me and putting together this conference. So uh, this talk is on the uh, information paradox, new aspects, um, some old aspects, some review. It's based on a couple of recent papers with Jeff Pennington and Arvind Shabazi Makadam, which are concerned with uh, complexity in the um, in the decoding of the Hawking radiation. So I'm going to begin with uh, just maybe some more uh, general statements, a little broader. So uh, the past couple of years, I've seen a lot of progress on the in black hole information paradox, and uh, here I've drawn a uh, a picture of sort of the canonical evaporating black hole in asymptotically flat space. Uh, and I, I personally found this, this progress to be really exciting because really insights from the developments on these last couple of years on the information paradox have started to teach us more about gravity in general. And we've, se we've seen a number of talks in this conference about uh, replica wormholes and um, various questions that these are bringing up as far as, uh, the, as, as gravity is concerned. And so, of course, this is extremely exciting. And it's one of the reasons that we're interested in the black hole information paradox in the first place. Uh, we want to learn more about uh, quantum gravity. Now, uh, you know, we could, we could keep on going in that direction, and that's great. But we would be remiss not to remember the fact that uh, despite all of this very rapid progress, we haven't actually resolved the uh, information paradox yet. And um, spoiler alert, I'm not going to resolve the information paradox in this talk. Uh, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about what, uh, about sort of thinking in that direction um, and trying to understand better how we might go about resolving the paradox. So I'm going to review the setup a little bit. I know that there have been a couple of other talks that have also reviewed the setup of the evaporating black holes in ADS and some of the recent progress. So. I won't take too long with it, but I do want to sort of uh, refresh everyone's memory from, say, yesterday uh, when this was uh, discussed. And I do want to, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the complexity of reconstruction, which is going to be the main subject of this talk, and the and, and specifically as applied to an isolated black hole, which is not, in fact, um, evaporating. So let me begin with uh, this sort of very broad overview and a reminder. Um, so the Hawking calculation, is, uh, can, can, it some, can sometimes be boiled down to a statement that a pure state on uh, past infinity is inconsistent with a regular state at the horizon and a pure state at uh, future infinity. And in particular, one of the uh, signatures that we look for um, of this apparent loss of unitarity is the Bonhamian entropy of quantum fields outside of the black hole. So the here minus trace row x. This means the state of the quantum fields outside of the of the black hole, which appears to be increasing as a function of time until it plateaus post evaporation. At least this is what we could think of as the Hawking calculation of the entropy of uh, of the radiation. Now, of course, we actually hope, think, uh, believe. Choose your uh, preferred word here. That the black hole evaporation process is unitary. So we expect that the von Neumann entropy of the entire system should be conserved, should be zero at all times. And when I say the entire system, I mean the entropy of the black hole and the radiation together. And that, so that suggests that once the black hole has evaporated and the radiation is literally the entire system, the entropy of the radiation should be zero. In other words, the von Neumann entropy here should be um, exactly zero. And this is the sort of canonical picture we like to draw here with the, um, the Hawking curve, the function, entropy as a function of time that increases and then plateaus. And then the entropy, um, the uh, page curve, sort of unitary behavior, where the entropy has to go back down to zero eventually. And so we get this non-monotonic uh, unitary curve for the entropy of the radiation. And uh, of course, the standard treatment of quantum fields on the curved background, as I mentioned, Hawking's treatment implies information loss. But um, we have these recent calculations, and now it's not so recent, I suppose, two years ago, that use holography to get unitarity, the unitary page curve, this, uh, this non-monotonic behavior um, over here. 
So because the idea behind this is extremely important for this talk, I'm going to slightly belabor the point. Uh, and apologies, apologies to those of you who have already seen this type of discussion uh, ad nauseum at this point. So we know by the Hawking calculation that if we compute the entropy of some evaporating ADS black hole via this usual formula, where rho bulk here refers to the state of quantum fields in the bulk, then we're going to get the Hawking curve. There's nothing different from doing this than you know, the original calculation. We haven't put in any new ingredient from quantum gravity. We're just going to get information loss. Now, we also know that if we compute the entropy of the dual CFT in, by the usual formula, we're going to get a unitary result since the dual CFT evolves unitarily. Here, row boundary is the state of the CFT. And so the basic idea behind these calculations was to say, well, we want to do a bulk calculation, but we want to be computing this quantity. So we would like to compute the von Neumann entropy of a boundary quantity using bulk language, which is why the holographic entanglement entropy prescription comes in or so-called quantum extremal surfaces. Given the title of this talk, you might suspect these are pretty critical. So the one m entropy of a density matrix, say row boundary, which has a bulk dual with non-perturbative quantum gravity in it, is given in this by this formula here. So we have the area of some surface chi over 4 g h bar plus the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields outside of chi. So here's the surface chi, the von Neumann entropy of quantum fields outside of chi. This is a quantity we call, we call the generalized entropy of the surface chi. Now, of course, chi is not just any surface. It's what we call the quantum extremal surface, which is to say that if you consider small perturbations of the location of chi, then the generalized entropy of chi does not change to leading order in those perturbations. So we call this quantum extremal because it's a local extremum of the generalized entropy. Now, the initial expectation when we first proposed this in 2014 was that quantum extremal surfaces should always lie close to classical extremal surfaces because we're talking about perturbative quantum gravity here, so we expect that they'll be perturbatively close to their classical cousins. Um, and classical extremal surfaces just extremize this, uh, this area term over here. And it actually turns out to be critically important for the computing the page curve, the unitary page curve, that this is false. Um, that we can have quantum extremal surfaces that are very far from classical extremal surfaces. Now, something that I didn't put on this slide, which is actually crucial for this talk, is the fact that we, if we have multiple quantum extremal surface candidates, with multiple surfaces that are quantum extremal, we always pick the one with the smallest generalized entropy to compute the von Neumann entropy of the boundary. It is possible, and in fact, the main topic of this talk will be that exactly that, to have more than one candidate quantum extremal surface. All right, so again, uh, this actually this coupling is also important for this talk, so I'll uh, mention it briefly. In general, ADS black holes don't, uh, don't large ADS black holes don't evaporate, and we have a difficult time understanding small ones. So to make a large ADS black hole evaporate, what we do is uh, we couple it to a bath, which is to say, for example, a CFT in the ground state, and then uh, we allow the black hole to sort of evaporate into this cold bath. And we hope that the evolution of the full system is unitary. And I say the full system, I mean including the bath. So uh, what's the mechanics of what happens here? Well, we do get the unitary page curve, there's a turnover, and we get this non-monotonic behavior. And the, the reason for that is a new quantum extremal surface that is nowhere near a classical one. So here's an example. We have a, an ADS black hole formed from collapse, a single-sided black hole. We couple it to some reservoir. This results in some shock propagating into the black hole space time. And what happens is we get a new a quantum extremal surface that sits here. And this quantum extremal surface is uh, becomes the dominant quantum extremal surface, which is to say, before the page time, the computation of the entropy is done using the empty set in the space time. But after the page time, the empty set is no longer the dominant quantum extremal surface which is to say the empty set has a larger generalized entropy than this surface over here. And so the downturn in the page curve can be viewed as a transition between the empty set and this new quantum extremal surface. This was uh, justified again, this, there have been uh, quite a few mentions of this already, so I'll just spend one slide on it because it's hard not to mention it in this connection. Um, this can be justified from the gravitational path integral so this, this formula and the jump in the quantum extremal surface from the sub from the empty set to the connected to the non-trivial surface, or if you're working with a two-sided black hole from the bifurcation surface 
to a new quantum extremal surface can be uh, justified using the gravitational path integral. So this jump in the quantum extremal surface occurs due to a switchover in the dominant saddle in the gravitational path integral when you use it to do a replica trick. So this disconnected saddle, uh, for if you have, you're doing a replica trick, you're looking at two replicas. This disconnected saddle corresponds to the old quantum extremal surface. This connected saddle corresponds to a new quantum extremal surface. And after the page curve, there's a switch over in the dominance. This one becomes minimal. And, um, and this one, this quantum extremal surface is now still quantum extremal, but no longer minimal. So now uh, I've sort of done with the review. So now I'd like to pose a question. We have two ways of computing the entropy of Hawking radiation. We can use the quantum extremal surface formula or equivalently the gravitational path integral. Or we can use Hawking's calculation, say uh, the Golubov transformations, et cetera. And they give two different answers. So if we want to really resolve the information paradox at the end of the day, what we'd like to do is to be able to understand how these two approaches diverge. Where do they differ? How do we do Hawking's calculation? How do we correct Hawking's calculation so as to get the same answer we get from the quantum extremal surface or the gravitational path integral? And similarly, how do we take the quantum extremal surface formula and obtain Hawking's calculation? How do we bridge the gap between these two different perspectives on black hole evaporation? One of which is involves unitary evaporation and the other one gives us a non-unitary answer. Uh, sorry, Nata. Uh, yeah. There's a question in the chat oh, question from the chat. Uh, Martin Nike. Yeah. Uh, he says uh, to apply the uh, quantum extremal surface formula after the page time, do we need to have some microscopic knowledge about which quanta in the bulk come from the black hole and which did not originate from it? Um, no. So in order to apply to so the, the quantum extremal surface formula, if you just uh, sort of want to apply it, all you have to do is to compute the, um, the entropy of the bulk quantum fields on a given Cauchy slice. And you don't need to know anything really about uh, previous Cauchy slices and uh, anything about the, the past. In fact, um, it's a really good question because this, will, this point will actually turn to be quite important for later in the talk where we'll be computing the entropy of bulk quantum fields on one Cauchy slice and figuring out where the quantum extremal surface is and not really caring about the fact that in the past there's some strong back reaction. So, um, and I'll, I mean, I'm just sort of giving a preview here. I'll talk about that in more detail uh, shortly, but uh, no, we do not need to know. Okay, thanks. I, I have a very stupid question because I, I always thought that the Hawking calculation is a very coarse calculation. I mean, they're, they're in principle, uh, you know, one over N and also exponential in N corrections. So mm -hmm. why would you think that you can, are you computing a row which looks I mean, any pure state of a thermalizing isolating system would, of, of high energy will look very, very close to a thermal state, right? You uh -huh. need to be able to differentiate very, very small corrections in order to be able to tell that the state is pure. So, so why, uh, why, why is the Hawking calculation even leading into a paradox in the first place? Wait, wait, could you just repeat the last couple words? I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, uh, you, the state indeed looks very close to thermal, mm -hmm. but you can't really compute the entropy from it because in principle, there are, there are all sorts of corrections to it and sure, those sure. corrections yeah. can conspire to, yeah. to send mm -hmm. your von Neumann entropy to zero. So, so why is this uh, a puzzle? Yeah, so, so um, I'm going to give you two answers, one of which is that you're slightly preempting my next couple of slides. So uh, the, the, the first we'll have to slightly wait. The second answer is um, it's, a, it's a good point. Keeping in mind, though, that to apply the quantum extremal surface formula, we also don't have access to this exponential uh, non-perturbatively suppressed corrections, and somehow it still works. So, um, so we we might want we, so there's a very powerful sense in which the quantum extremal surface formula is uh, is an effective field theory calculation. So it does look like we can do an effective field theory calculation and get um, get unitarity. So then there is the question of what do why does Hawking's effective field theory calculation not get it? Um, that said, I think your question is a very good one, and in fact, it's 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 a major point in my talk. So I will I think I will uh, address it a little bit more in in the next slide or two when I do talk about exponential uh, complexity and, and corrections like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so we, but 
I guess to sort of drive the point home is we, we want to identify, we have, we have various hypotheses on where Hawking went wrong, um, including potentially not including certain corrections. We'd like to be able to ask, to, to pinpoint what, what is missing and how, why, how come it's there in the quantum extremal surface formula. Um, is there another question in the chat? Um, uh, yes, thank you, Yasef, that's right. So, I mean, there, there are corrections, but uh, we need to figure out what they are, so. Okay, so, um, so we could ask, where, where did Hawking go wrong? And pre-2019, I probably would have said something along the lines of, uh, you know, Harlow and Hayden argued that decoding the Hawking radiation uh, under assumption of unitarity is uh, an exponentially hard task. So maybe somewhere, somehow, Hawking's calculation somehow lost track of any exponentially complex data in the state. So this is uh, the logic behind this follows from a paper, a series of papers uh, originally by Harlow and Hayden, followed by Scott Aronson, and uh, recently by Kim Tang and Preskill, who showed that decoding the Hawking radiation is exponentially hard, it's exponentially complex. So uh, Hawking's calculation could potentially be in some sense coarse graining over the outcomes of high complexity operations. Now, if you ask people now where Hawking went wrong, people will probably say something along the lines of, isn't it obvious? He used the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral, where by the wrong saddle, we mean the non-minimal quantum extremal surface that comes from the disconnected topology. Now, of course, there's a caveat here, which is, it's not clear where in Hawkins' calculation he just indiscriminately started to impose ignorance of high complexity data. And he also didn't use the gravitational path integral. So neither one of these is really pinpointing for us like, aha, this is exactly the place where Hawking you know, omitted something or didn't, didn't include something. But we're trying to bridge the gap here. So really any insight is, uh, is valuable at this point. So we have two perspectives on what could be missing, but could, what, what could it be that the quantum extremal surface formula knows and Hawking's calculation doesn't? These complexity and uh, wrong saddle. And how are they compatible? So by understanding the way in which these two mistakes could be one and the same, we can make progress on understanding the paradox better. So what does it mean in terms of the Lorentzian bulk geometry to implement ignorance of high complexity data and to use the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral? And of course, the second one we sort of already know that means using the non-minimal, a non-minimal quantum extremal surface. But what about the first one? And how can we package these two into one unified statement? And, um, and this leads me to the uh, complexity of reconstructing the black hole interior. So this is the, the, the crux of this talk is really so the so-called Python's lunch proposal, which is, uh, uh, which is work from December, 2019. By, um, by Brown, Gribian, Pennington, and Susskind. And they, so they were motivated by tensor networks, but they proposed essentially um, a partial answer, at least to this question that I just asked. So they proposed that whenever there is some non-minimal quantum extremal surface that lives inside of the entanglement, entanglement wedge, meaning closer to the boundary than the minimal quantum extremal surface, then reconstruction of the region behind this non-minimal quantum extremal surface is exponentially complex. So why is this called the Python's lunch? It's called the Python's lunch because of the sort of shape of the Cauchy slice that contains these surfaces. So here we have, this is the minimal quantum extremal surface. This is a non-minimal quantum extremal surface. This here is the bifurcation surface of the event horizon. So this is a two-sided black hole. You have an asymptotic boundary. And then we have this region in between these two, this bulge, which these, these folks called the, um, the Python's lunch. And the complexity is given by, um, is proportional to this difference in generalized entropies between the non-minimal quantum extremal surface and the sort of largest uh, surface over here, which is the sort of the bulge of this uh, so-called lunch region. And so this is very beautiful connection between the complexity as described by Hollow and Hayden and, um, and the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, which is the, the wrong saddle that um, gives you non-unitary behavior, that does not give you the downturn in the page curve. But it's not, this, this proposal is not quite enough for our purposes. In order to have a definitive connection between coarse graining over complexity, and I put this in quotation marks, and the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, we need a slightly stronger form of the Python's lunch. It's not enough just to know that, um, 
whenever you, there, there's a quantum extremal surface, then you have this exponential complexity. You also need to know that it doesn't exist without a non-minimal quantum extremal surface. And so recently, Jeff and Arvin and I proposed what we call the strong pythons launch, which is that non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces are in fact the only source of, uh, of exponential complexity. And we specifically mean ones that live in the entanglement wedge, otherwise they're sort of not relevant. So the outermost uh, outer quantum extremal surfaces. And this, this uh, th with this slightly stronger perspective, we have, um, we put these two pictures on the same footing. Ignorance of high complexity is identical to ignorance of the true saddle. You're using the non-minimal quantum extremal surface to compute entropy, to define the entanglement wedge. That means everything behind the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, which is the only possible region where you could have exponential complexity, simply, you're simply not sensitive to that. So this is a proposal. I should so this is uh, I should have probably put a proposal here. It's a conjecture. Um, so what is the status of this conjecture? Well, in the strictly classical limit, proving this reduces to showing that there exists an efficient way of reconstructing the region between the event horizon and the outermost quantum extremal surface. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. So we will, you might say, well, maybe we might expect that it's exponentially hard to reconstruct everything behind the event horizon. And even if you have some kind of an out, some kind of extremal surface, we would expect that thing, there might be stuff outside of it that's still exponentially hard to reconstruct. So classically, what we, say, what we might say is, okay, we'll talk about classical extremal surfaces. Let's show that it's possible to simply reconstruct everything between the event horizon and the nearest quantum extremal surface. This would be enough to prove the strong Python slash proposal in the strictly classical limit. And, um, and we were actually able to do that constructively by essentially showing that you can use a glorified version of HKLL uh, by allowing yourself to impose arbitrary boundary conditions to causally reconstruct the region behind the event horizon up to the outermost classical extremal surface. And I, I want to emphasize, this is strictly classical. This is a very classical construction. And we also showed that this protocol that we gave breaks down once you reach the outermost extremal surface so that you really get up to that one and no further, which is confirmation of both the original and the strong Python's launch proposal in the classical limit. But uh, of course, we're more interested in the quantum corrections than we are in the classical limit. And it's sort of, we're more interested in the semi-classical regime where naively there, it does seem that there exist obvious counterexamples. So um, let me talk about this. So there's an obvious counterexample in sort of a very standard setup. So let's forget all about these fancy setups of black holes evaporating into reservoirs. Let's just talk about a black hole in ADS with reflecting boundary conditions, form from collapse, eventually equilibrates at late times. Now, this black hole never evaporates into a reservoir. The minimal quantum extremal surface in this space time is the empty set. In fact, it is the only quantum extremal surface in this space time. If you have a black hole formed from collapse, it has and you have reflecting boundary conditions, it has no non trivial compact quantum extremal surfaces. And it's actually pretty easy to see this with spherical symmetry, even though it's also true without spherical symmetry. So suppose we had a non trivial quantum extremal surface in this space time. Then, well, by definition, if we looked at small variations of the generalized entropy, say in this past null direction, well, it would be, the, the change would be zero, this is an extremum. And it also is the case that as you approach the asymptotic boundary, approach spherical slices of the asymptotic boundary, you're also approaching vanishing, uh, vanishing change in the variations in this direction as well for the generalized entropy of surfaces as you approach the asymptotic boundary. So this variation is zero here and it's zero here. And there's a, uh, a very strong conjecture, the so-called quantum focusing conjecture. It's, uh, many of us believe it's true. That tells you that uh, you cannot have, uh, or you can also use the generalized second law in this case, that uh, this quantity is monotonic along this, uh, this null surface, which means that it can't be increasing and decreasing. And so the only possibility is for it to be zero everywhere. But in fact, it's not possible for it to be zero everywhere unless you're in exactly the equilibrium state. 
And so you get a contradiction and you say, okay, well, it's simply not possible to have a non-trivial quantum extremal surface in this space time. Now you might say, well, wait a second, we had a non-trivial quantum extremal surface in the uh, evaporating black hole, evaporating one-sided black hole. So why was that not a problem earlier? And the, the crux of the matter is really that the transparent boundary conditions actually ch change things. So um, since I'm running maybe a little bit short on time, I'm just going to say one or two words about this, which is in this space time, this surface is quantum extremal, no matter what Cauchy slice you evaluate the entropy on. In this space time, because of the um, it's transparent boundary conditions, this surface is only quantum extremal with respect to some particular slice, which means that you can't really compare the variation in S gen of this with the variation in S gen of that, um, unless you also evaluate this and this slice, and it is not quantum extremal with respect to that slice. So um, I'm going to not, not belabor this point, but if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer in the Q&A. Okay, so then we have, we say, okay, there's no quantum extremal surface in this single-sided black hole um, that's at equilibrium at late times. But we expect that reconstructing the interior modes, these interior outgoing modes, is actually exponentially hard. There are many reasons to believe this. For example, this is a Transplankian problem if you try to evolve them backwards in time. So the Python's launch proposal, the strong Python's launch proposal, suggests that we should see another outermost non-minimal quantum extremal surface here in this space time. But we just showed that there is no non-trivial quantum extremal surface in this space time. So it seems that the strong Python's launch proposal must be obviously false. And uh, as it turns out, it's not obviously false or I would not be giving this talk. So what, uh, what's the subtlety that uh, frees us of this problem? And in order to really understand the, what's going on here, before we talk about complexity of reconstruction, it's actually useful to talk a little bit about the reconstruction itself. So if we consider some uh, bulk operator, phi of x, its action is really only defined within some subspace of states of quantum fields and some semi-classical bulk background. So this is for, for specifically for a bulk operator. And so within this, this subspace of states, this code subspace, if we want to reconstruct phi of x from the entire asymptotic boundary, if this is, then, then what, we, what we have to be the case is that this lies in the entanglement wedge of the asymptotic boundary. The, the important point here is that the entanglement wedge can change depending on which state of the code subspace we're in, since quantum extremal surfaces are defined using the state of the bulk quantum fields. So if you imagine you have some kind of a jump into quantum extremal surface, depending on which state in the code subspace you're in, then whether you can reconstruct phi of x or not will, uh, will depend on which state you're talking about. So this, is, uh, th this was pointed out by Hayden and Pennington and Akers, Leichenauer and Levine, where again, if you have a couple of quantum, different quantum extremal surfaces, then um, reconstruction of an operator that's between them, well, gamma one could end up being the dominant quantum extremal surface in some states, and gamma two could end up being the dominant quantum extremal surface in other states. So where does the Python's launch come in here? Well, it's useful to sort of see this from the perspective of, uh, of tensor networks. So this is a caricature, a tensor network caricature. These tensors don't stand for anything in particular. They're just, uh, just shapes here. I'm not subscribing to any particular tensor model, tensor network model. Um, so let's consider a tensor network sort of caricature of the Python's lunch picture. So this is may, maybe a two-sided black hole. Uh, we have some CFT left over here, some CFT right over here. And the, we have our minimal quantum extremal surface, which cuts through uh, very few lengths. We have a sort of what we call the appetizer surface, which cuts through more lengths. It's still extremal, but it's, uh, it's not minimal. And then there's the bulge surface, which cuts through many lengths. So the condition that an operator that's between this and that be reconstructable is essentially the condition that um, in, in, the, in the language of, of uh, in the quantum formation language, this, there's an isometry from gamma min all the way to the asymptotic boundary. And essentially what that requires that the area of this, which by area here, we mean the number of legs that this cuts is larger than the area of this, the number of legs that this cuts, plus all of the bulk legs, which are these dots um, uh, coming out of the page, plus all of the, if we cut all of those. And that is just, so th this is the log of di, where i here is the dots, which again represents the bulk quantum field degrees of freedom. 
And so this equation can be rewritten as a statement that the generalized entropy of the, this appetizer surface in the maximally mixed state is larger than the generalized entropy of this minimal extremal surface in the maximally mixed state. So in other words, the relevant thing to ask is whether which of the quantum extremal surfaces is minimal in the, in the maximally mixed state of our code subspace. And it turns out that a similar story holds for complexity. And what's, but really what we care about is this constriction. This is the cause of the exponential complexity. We care about what this constriction is in the maximally mixed state. And since I'm, I think I'm already a little bit over time, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time belaboring this. I'm just going to just assert that complexity of reconstruction is going to be determined by the non-minimal quantum extremal surface in the maximally mixed state in the code subspace. And so from here, what happens is, uh, is pretty clear. So we construct the code subspace from the states of the Hawking modes across the horizon, fix the bulk, we fix the bulk geometry on this Cauchy slice sigma. We consider the, uh, the Hawking modes across the horizon here, and we construct a code subspace from those, just the state of these the states of these Hawking modes. And we ask in the maximally mixed state, in other words, where the union of these two Hawking modes is itself maximally mixed with some other system. Is there a non-minimal quantum extremal surface that lives on the event horizon so that this would be behind it and be exponentially complex? And it turns out that this is indeed what happens. We get a new quantum extremal surface that's a leading order, lives on the event horizon, and separates out these highly complex Hawking modes we expect would be exponentially complex. And the reason for this is that this, this disentangling these Hawking modes results in, in a large entropy gradient which is uh, which allows us to have this new quantum extremal surface. And the reason that this circumvents the earlier um, argument that you can't have quantum extremal surface in this in these one-sided black holes form from collapse is that this and these, this this disentangling of these modes actually results in back reaction. If you evolve backwards, it involves in back it results in back reaction that results in a white hole singularity. And so this surface, there's actually a past event horizon that prevents you from um, ever communicating to the asymptotic boundary with that surface. All right, so, uh, so we proposed the strong Python lunch proposal, non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces are the exclusive source of exponential complexity. And this provides a way of starting to bridge the difference between these two ways in which Hawking was wrong. And the classical limit, we can uh, argue for the strong Python's launch on fairly general grounds. I wouldn't call it a proof. It's a physics level of rigor uh, proof, but it's, it's pretty strong. In the quantum case, we don't prove it. It's very hard to imagine how we would prove it. But what we can do is we can conclusively rule out certain obvious counterexamples. But show, by showing that the space times that don't contain non-trivial quantum extremal surfaces still have a maximally mixed state, which does have a non-trivial quantum extremal surface. I'm going to skip my uh, typical uh, states and find firewalls slide and just leave you with a couple of aspirational questions. Uh, thank you and sorry for going over time. Thanks a lot, Meta, for the very nice talk. Let's see if I clap. Okay, so um, are there any questions? If so, please unmute yourselves. Hi, I have a question. So this uh, Python lunch uh, corrections, are they going to change the structure of the horizon? Are we going to get vacuum at the horizon or do you expect to get something else? Uh, good. So um, so these are- I guess this is the slide about firewalls, which we didn't show. <laughs> um, yeah, so in order to see, so in this picture here, um, so in this, yeah, in this picture here, what we do in this particular construction is we actually say, okay, let's, let's, let's work within some small code subspace where we have some, you know, we, we know what the horizon is, it's so an atypical state uh, where we have some smooth horizon, uh, that, that semi-classical classical smooth horizon and, and, and talk about just the code subspace of these Hawking modes at this moment in time. Now you, you're right to ask, well, what about typical states and, um, and what would happen in, in, that, in that case? Um, and so in that case, well, okay, if we assume that we can still do a sort of a semi-classical analysis near the horizon, then what ends up happening, in fact, if you sort of expand your code subspace to include typical states, is that this, um, this appetizer surface actually, instead of being subdominant, becomes dominant. And um, it, it ends up 
it, but when, in, in a maximally mixed state. And so it ends up um, in some sense being the geometric avatar of state dependence. But as insofar as um, whether, you know, if we have some kind of uh, wild behavior at the event horizon and we don't have a geometry there and we don't know, I don't know how to compute quantum extremal surfaces. In that case, I would say that at this point, unfortunately, that's out of the purview of what we have done. No, I was just hoping for some self consistency, you know, the way the, the, the recent um, Hayden Pennington argument that, you know, but just based on self consistency, you know, you must show that, you know, there's some, I mean, in, in typical states, there should be something there. So if you just assume empty space, then you get something which is not empty by mm -hmm. making these arguments. I was just hoping if you can. I, I just, I don't think that at this stage, um, we know what bearing this has on that on that question, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's uh, interesting for for future work, though. Thanks. That, that is very useful. I'd like to ask a follow up on the question I asked uh, during the talk. Um, so, if I have a black hole and some radiation outside it, um, I can imagine two situations. One where the radiation outside of it uh, came from a somewhat larger black hole. Mm -hmm. And another situation where I have roughly speaking the same Cauchy slice, but uh, I've got a black hole and some radiation outside it that didn't come from the black hole. Yes. And, I, and I, I try to apply this quantum extremal surface prescription to both of those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I think I understand your question now. Mm -hmm. And so, so you know, in one case, I'm trying to, to, to derive some conclusion about the, you know, unitarity of Hawking radiation, um, you know, based on the, you know, what this quantum extremal surface is doing. The other case, I shouldn't be, you know, drawing the same conclusion because the radiation never came from the black hole, but nevertheless, uh, you know, adding and subtracting radiation outside the black hole that didn't come from the black hole seems to move around the quantum extremal surface <laughs> because the quantum extremal service is, is some balance between the two. Uh, to, uh, to an extent. Um, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm let you no, 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 that, that, that's basically the question. Uh, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So in fact, um, what you're talking about is a little bit the phenomenon that we have over here. So he, and so if you don't, if, so if, if you imagine that your radiation outside the black hole did not come from, um, from the black hole itself evaporating or radiating, then you would imagine that there's sub-maximal sub entanglement between the, um, the interior and exterior modes. And so that would, that would certainly affect the location and the behavior of the quantum extremal surface. So for example, over here, we, we, we nucleated a new quantum extremal surface, which is subdominant, as a consequence of changing the entanglement structure between these, uh, between these partners. So if you, if you imagine that you know, your radiation came from a totally different system, it might even be in a product state. And that would be very important for, um, for where the quantum extremal surface is. I mean, the quantum extremal surface cares about the gradients and the entropy as you move things around. And that's going to care a lot about whether you have some product state, whether you have some mixed state, or whether you have some pure state. Um, and, and so that the, the quantum extremal surface should be sensitive to the two different situations that you describe. And indeed, you know, when we have a, uh, when these two are maximally entangled with one another, then we don't have a quantum extremal surface here. But when they're maximally entangled together with some third system, then we do have a quantum extremal surface here. So the structure of the entanglement is, is extremely important. And I think in the two situations you described, the quantum extremal surfaces will behave differently. So it's because the in the in the one case I have in the bulk term in the calculation I have also the um, the negative energy partners of the exterior modes. That's right. Yeah. Where, whereas in the other one with just radiation that never came from the black hole, I just have the the modes outside and not the interior modes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, in your talk, you mentioned that um, Hawking was run on two accounts. I think I understand what was the one mistake, but could you maybe comment what was another mistake of Hawking's calculation? Sure. Um, I'm going to go a little bit less strongly than claiming that Hawking was wrong on two accounts, but uh, I'll explain what, uh, what my hypothesis is on the two accounts. Um, let's see. Let's go here. Uh, great. So the first, actually, which, which one do you like? And then I can explain the, the, the complementary one. 
I cannot read very quickly from the screen, but I think the, the, the one mistake was that he was cal calculating entropy uh, of individual photons and summing them together rather, rather than considering them all together and using the minimal surface prescription. Sure. That's, okay. that's what I assume, right? Right, right, okay. So the two different perspectives that, um, that I have on this, and there could be um, and many different ones in the large and limit, um, one is that in order to decode the Hawking radiation, when you assume that the evolution is unitary, you, um, you need access, you need to be able to put the, the, the state through an exponentially complex quantum circuit. That was the argument of Harlow and Hayden. And so if you somehow say that, if you somehow coarse grain over any exponentially complex data, then you would never be able to do any calculation that would show you that the, uh, that the radiation is unitary, um, evolving unitarily. So, um, so that's one perspective that you simply, if you've lost access to exponentially complex data the, in some way, then, um, then you, you don't, you're never going to be able to see that the evolution is unitary. And then the second perspective is that, um, you know, you use the wrong saddle in the gravitational path integral, or you use the wrong, um, the, the wrong quantum extremal surface. And by the wrong one, I mean the non-minimal one, which is, I think, the first thing that you that you mentioned. So these are the two, two at least two different perspectives, which by the Python's lunch uh, or the strong Python's lunch end up really being uh, one and the same. Uh, sorry, but is it is it right to say that those two explanations you gave, these are two different interpretations of sort of one mistake or one flow with his calculation? Yeah. These are not two different flows. So a priori, you might look at them and say these look like very different mistakes. But um, part of the point of uh, you know of the Python slash story is to to try to make the point that really no, these are these are the same mistake at the end of the day. Thanks. Okay, we have time for one uh, super urgent question. If anybody has one, no. Well, if not, uh, let's uh, let's thank uh, Neta again for a very nice talk, and also to Igor, if he's still around. Thank you.